So last week on Declassified Australia, my colleague, uh, Peter Cronauer, it wasn't written by me, but my colleague Peter did this amazing story that essentially was a world exclusive story, which detailed how Pine Gap, which is one of the US's leading intelligence gathering bases in, as you know, in near Alice Springs in the center of Australia, was providing real time intelligence to the US, which was being passed directly to the Israelis, which was being used directly in their targeting of alleged Hamas terrorists. And I say alleged because, as we've seen in the last month, massive numbers of civilians have died in the process. And this is in some ways not surprising because Pine Gap was a key US asset in its wars against Iraq, Afghanistan, and in Syria, in the wars war against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And this shows that Australian officials, the Australian government at the highest level, are deeply complicit, potentially um, exposed to war crimes trials in the future because the intelligence that they're passing along to the Israelis is being used to commit war crimes. So the Australian government at the highest level is well aware of this. I'm talking about Albanese, Penny Wong. So on the one hand, you have Penny Wong and Albanese. Yes, we really uh, support some kind of you know humanitarian pause. And yes, Israel should really take care about how they're targeting Palestinian civilians, while at the same time knowing that they're not just allowing, but encouraging a US military asset, which does, by the way, have Australian officials and employees on site. It's mostly Americans at Pine Gap, but there are some Aussies who are complicit in what Israel is doing. And the story kind of went viral, I think, because well, no one else had reported it. And Peter has a lot of great contacts, including someone who used to work at Pine Gap, actually, who remarkably is willing to speak out about it. He doesn't work there right now, but he worked there in the past. So, yeah, I think it goes to the heart of Australia's duplicity. In, in each of these bombing raids on hospitals by Israel, excused by uh, the argument that uh, Hamas had some hidden uh, infrastructure underneath, mm, mm. Uh, you know, each one of these uh, would have... Uh, taken place on the basis of the signal intelligence that came from Pine Gap. Pine Gap, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and I mean, this is why it's it's so damning. And it's interesting how since that story came out, as Peter and I have watched very closely, not one media outlet in Australia has picked it up. Now, why is that? I don't necessarily think that's a conspiracy. I think it's partly... We didn't break the story, so therefore we won't give attraction. It's sometimes it's kind of journalism turf wars, but I think there's also an unwillingness. I mean, there's not much, there's there's too little reporting about Pine Gap. I mean, Pine Gap is a key global U.S. intelligence asset, which has been deeply complicit in the entire war on terror for twenty plus years. And as you know, Israel is not part of the Five Eyes intelligence sharing network, but it's arguably the unofficial sixth member. I think that's pretty uncontroversial to say. And so the fact that Australia and the US are providing all this well, allegedly invaluable intelligence, although, as I said, I would seriously question the accuracy of that intelligence based on what we're seeing in Gaza at the moment, that when Israel claims to be pinpoint targeting terrorists, I mean, a blind person can see that's just an absolute lie. Is there is there an element here? It's uh, of the normalization of Australia's role as perhaps like Israel, a giant um, imperial land base battleship or aircraft. Well, carrier. I think it is. I think yeah. Australia, in some yeah. ways, is willingly doing that. And obviously, yeah. Pine Gap is just the beginning. This desire by the former government and the current Labor government to massively expand, expand the U.S. military footprint in the north of the country to allow far more U.S. military assets, both intelligence bases and actual troops. What the people don't know is that very much since 2016, under the former coalition government and Malcolm Turnbull as prime minister, there was a conscious decision to massively expand Australia's weapons industry to try to become one of the world's biggest export, exporters of arms. 
And this continued for a number of years during the coalition years. Labor comes into office in May last year. Nothing has changed. In other words, this, you know, the, the, the presumption that, well, it'll change if Labor gets in, nothing has changed. And the context for this is that some of the most concerning elements of this has been selling weapons to Israel, which I'll get to in a minute. But equally concerning in the past years has been selling weapons to Saudi Arabia during its brutal genocidal war against Yemen. And in the last years, there's been numerous efforts by journalists, by other politicians, mostly the Greens, by activists to try to uncover some details, bring some transparency into what Australia is selling, what is it being used for, and where is it being used? And both the former government and the current government have been fundamentally unwilling to do so. And... When it comes to Israel, for a number of years, Australia has been selling a range of defence equipment. It's not all deadly weapons. Some of it is, for example, body armour. But that's pretty relevant when we talk about the events after October 7. Is, for example, Israel using this body armour in its current war against Gaza? I mean, the short answer is we don't know. And Australia has arguably one of the most unaccountable weapons trades in the world. Now, I don't mean to idealise, say, America. America has a much more, strangely enough, transparent system where the weapons are going, what they're being used for. I mean, let's be clear, though, America provides 45% of the world's weapons. They're the world's biggest arms dealer by a mile. So I don't mean to idealise the American system. I only mean it in the context of that Australia has resolutely refused for years to provide any kind of accountability. And I think this is not just about weapons. It's also very similar around the Defence Department, whereas a lot of journalists who were trying to get information after 9-11 about, for example, our deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan just found this utter obsession with secrecy and lack of accountability. Again, whereas in the US and even British system, there was a bit more openness, not by any means to defend what the US and British militaries did, of course. And I think it very much fits into a similar tradition uh, that we're unwilling to explain where some of these weapons might be going and where they're ending up. And it is remarkable that after October 7, many Western nations, Australia, US and UK, have not just sent, as far as we're aware, the US certainly has, more weapons to Israel, which is using in, on its brutal bombardment of Gaza. And America, to some extent, has sort of acknowledged that, talked about that. There's been some good reporting about that, including in the New York Times and elsewhere. Whereas in Australia, we're left to attempt a legal case in the federal court. People like David Shoebridge in Parliament trying to get some details. Journalists trying to put in FOIs sort of scrambling for more information. And on one level, it's rather ironic because Israel is one of the most powerful militaries, certainly in the Middle East and arguably in the world. It is now the 10th biggest arms dealer in the world. It sells weapons to huge numbers of nations across the globe, as my book talks about. We don't even know the exact number. It's probably around 140, 145. So the vast majority of nations on this planet And it's curious that after October 7, there was a, one has to presume either a, what I would call a sort of solidarity mission, so to speak, from Western countries to assist Israel's bombardment of Gaza or an actual request from Israel for additional munitions and equipment. We don't know is the short answer. We don't know. I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if it's a bit of both, that the way that many... Western nations wanted to show their blind and uncritical support for Israel was to fast track new weapons and defense equipment for Israel's what they would call 9-11 moment. And regardless of any accountability or checks on where those weapons are going, and I note just finally that when Australian officials are asked about this, or the government for that matter, they say, well, there's always a lot of human rights checks before the weapons are sent. I mean, It's just an absolute lie. We know it's a lie because if anyone seriously believes that, for example, sending weapons to Saudi Arabia when they were fighting, the war has died down a little bit now, 
not entirely resolved, but not as brutal as it once was. The idea that Saudi Arabia, which has committed gross human rights abuses in Yemen, is, and has, by the way, bombed wedding parties, huge amounts of civilians. The idea that Australia cares about where those weapons are going, and the reason they don't have to care is there is no accountability. There has been no, for example, trial of a Defence Department official or minister who would be complicit in sending weapons to a state that commits war crimes, whether it's Saudi or Israel or others. And I think the only way this will likely stop is two things. One, if this federal court case succeeds, and of course I have no personal involvement in it, but I know some of the people behind it and I support it 110%, or at some point in the coming years, all you would need in a way is one almost like a test case in the US, in the UK, in The Hague, in Australia, of an official who had been um, deeply complicit in arranging weapons to be sent to one of these nations. And I note that since October 7, a handful of senior US government officials have resigned over this issue, saying that they have been deeply concerned that the kind of weapons that the US is sending to Israel is involved in Israel committing war crimes and they did not want to be a part of it. When I see those people, I think, what, what were you doing before October the 7th? Mm. But anyway, you know, you said the thing, okay, people people have their own agendas and their own principles and, you know, one, one doesn't want to be too judgmental. They resigned when they resigned. They took a stand. I respect that, you know. So that to me is the context. And that has not happened in Australia at all. Now, when people think about... Um... Uh, military exports and the arms trade, they, they, they're thinking about um, material things. They're thinking about F-35 uh, components that I believe Australia does manufacture and it feeds into the chain and some of that probably ends yeah. up in Israel. Uh, but there is the whole software side of things. And uh, there's, the te- there's not just the, uh, the development of software, but the testing of software. Uh, and And how... How, to what extent are our, our, our universities being drawn into this commercial strategic mm. kind of uh, deals that are being stitched up? Well, we actually got a big story on Declassified coming out about that soon, not written by me, but yeah. I'm involved with some of the people who are doing it. But yes, the short answer is that in the last seven or eight years, started by the former government, coalition government, accelerated when AUKUS was announced by Morrison in, was that 2021? Just check that. I think it was 2021. And obviously when Albanese and the Labor government have hugely accelerated it, there has been a determined effort to bring in the entire university sector to almost do what they claim is the patriotic thing and teach and educate the next generation of people who can assist in the AUKUS philosophy. What does that practically mean? huge amounts of Australian and American arms dealers from Lockheed Martin to Raytheon and others who are deeply complicit themselves in massive war crimes from Iraq to Afghanistan to Yemen are paying for, recruiting, supporting universities financially to bring in young 18, 19, 20-year-olds to learn about, for example, how to produce surveillance equipment weapons uh, working at all the universities and I remember soon after Albanese announced the massive submarine deal last year you had the head of University of Australia going to Washington DC and basically saying and I'm paraphrasing here you could find her exact wording essentially saying we're open for business defense companies please come and almost again my words not hers please come and colonize our universities and it was framed very much around this idea of this is almost our patriotic duty. We have a apparently, so we're told, a moral obligation to support the AUKUS deal and therefore protect Australia and apparently potentially fight against Beijing in the coming years by training the next generation of militarised citizens. And it's something that, A, I don't think most Australians know, and be something that we should fundamentally oppose. And it says a lot for the university sector, nothing good, 
that they're so desperate for defense contractor money. And as we've discovered in our story, which will hopefully be out sometime this year or early next year, there seemingly is no interest or care or concern about the fact that these companies have blood on their hands from the kind of activities that they've been supporting and backing, even in the last 20 years, that Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Ukraine. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, and this is being mirrored, by the way, in the US and the UK too, that these companies are, and I might say Australia too, it's not just the university sector. They're actually starting younger than that at schools, high schools, organizing science fairs, trying to get younger kids interested in the defense sector. I mean, it's pretty insidious. So it doesn't start when you're 18 or 19, but for some kids, even younger. And not all schools are signing up to that, of course, but disturbing amounts of schools are. Yeah. Has this particular offensive particularly the aggressiveness of the Netanyahu regime, actually push the envelope or push the limits to the consensus, which, uh, you know, uncomfortable consensus that was built around the security issue. I think what you've seen both for a number of years now in many Western countries here, US, parts of Europe, the UK, is a growing awareness and support for Palestine that didn't really exist in such a mainstream way 15, 20 years ago that the and it's obviously hard to generalize the left as you be well aware there's some of the left that's very supportive of israel particularly after october 7 so it is complicated but you, there's no doubt that the u.s has seen in the last month the largest public protests for palestine in history you have seen the biggest global protests uh some have said as uh, the biggest public protests since the iraq war protests in 2002 and three You've seen some of the largest Jewish dissenting protests in the US. I'm sure you saw um, that protest around the Statue of Liberty this week, Grand Central Station last week, US Congress the week before. Now, they're a minority of Jews, to be sure, but they're a growing and vocal minority. And obviously, as someone Jewish myself, I have a lot of respect for that position because the Jewish establishment remains such in lockstep with the Israeli government, long before October 7, of course, hmm. but particularly since. And it's just so dangerous because I would argue it makes Israelis and Jews more unsafe. It doesn't make this doesn't make us safer. Yeah. And obviously what happened on October 7 was horrific. Absolutely horrific. But what Israel's doing now is making us all less safe. So no, I do think that there is a growing awareness, as I've been saying for a long time, that the Israel-Palestine conflict is not just about Israel-Palestine, right? It's about the arms industry, US foreign policy, imperialism, colonialism, Western powers. A huge amounts of issues. Also, a lot of it's about U.S. domestic policy, which is already going to have a big impact on the U.S. election next year. As one example, you may have seen there's been lots of polling of the Arab American population, which is quite large, who traditionally vote Democrats, supported Biden in 2020. Support for Biden has literally collapsed, and uh, I think it's obviously hard to know what's going to happen in the coming year. But I think Biden will find that a lot of people, younger people especially, do not accept anymore the presumption that the US's role is to be uncritical towards Israel, particularly when it's committing breaching when it's breaching human rights and committing war crimes in Gaza. So I think there is a growing awareness. And I also see this finally direct action of Israeli ships sending weapons to Israel. I see this mm. in the US and here. Mm akin to what happened 40 years ago or 50 years ago in relation to South Africa. Mm -hmm. That movement needs to grow because the only way this will ever end, in my view, and I've said this for a long time, is economic pressure on Israel. It's the only way. Mm 